Let's transport ourselves back into the hermitage, each one of us. We're on chapter 12, page 128. And where we left off last time was uh, Yogananda sharing Sri Yukteswarji's thoughts on on gender, essentially, on, on masculine and feminine aspects of the soul. And first of all, to say not for us not to get confused by the outward form and always to try to tune into that unified one soul reality that is way beyond any gender, but at the same time also to be aware, especially on the spiritual path. And Sri Yukteswarji is here working with young men uh, to make them um, eventually renunciates. At least that was the path that his ashram had chosen, although many did go on and also get married. But while they were under his training, of course, Brahmacharya was a major part of that process. And it doesn't in any way relate to man or woman. It's for both. If we are interested in the spiritual journey, we're interested in that final goal, there's going to have to be a certain self-control we're going to have to awaken within ourselves. And so continuing that thought, Sri Yukteswarji says, Do not allow yourself to be thrashed by the provoking whip of a beautiful face. How can sense slaves enjoy the world? Its subtle flavors escape them while they grovel in primal mud. All nice discriminations are lost to the man of elemental lusts. So, of course, this is, has nothing to do with man or woman. This is the innate tendency in all of us to want to enjoy this world through our senses. And so, do not allow yourself to be trashed by the provoking whip of a beautiful face. And the first way that we want is to draw in, you know, through our eyes. We're looking for beauty, we're looking for perfection, even in people around us, even in those who we will fall in love with. You know, we're always looking for pleasing features, be it man or woman, because that's how we feel we get to enjoy this world. Everything that's pleasing to us, we want more of that through our senses. And here, of course, he is saying that as long as we're sense slaves, we'll in fact never enjoy the world. It may seem that that's not true, but that's because what Sri Yukteswarji is talking about here is that there are subtler flavors, that there's a subtler reality than what our senses can enjoy and so he says its subtle flavors escape them while they grovel in primal mud in the sense we're so used to enjoying the world from the first chakra first and second in this particular case is this that's all we just know we just know matter and we only want to enjoy matter and Sri Yukteswarji that's like for him that's like playing in the mud playing in the dirt when there's so much more for us to experience and we will not experience it as long as our senses are the primary way that we relate to the world. And so it's an important uh, understanding for us. It's not so much, oh, you should not live in the senses. The senses are bad and the senses are horrible and go beyond the senses. It is as long as you live in the senses, you won't be able to live in any other way. You won't be able to appreciate, enjoy and experience the true beauty, the true power of this world, because there you are, like little children, just happily playing in the mud, not knowing what other wonderful toys await us. Just as the purpose of eating is to satisfy hunger, not greed, so the sex instinct is designed for the the propagation of the species according to natural law never for the kindling on of insatiable longings so of course now this is another harder one no none of us want to know that we can't you know give ourselves in to our desires to fulfill whatever pleasures that we're looking no matter how many no matter how much our intellect knows okay yeah this makes sense of course i have to go beyond this but uh, at the end of the day 
you know that uh, very desire it's strong and it's strong not because um, it's made strong it's just because we've given into it so many times we've we've enjoyed it so many times we've used it so many times so the power that exists in our lower centers in fact it's not a joke it's it's real power that exists it's we've fed that power we've magnetized those senses so of course it's now going to take a little bit of energy but as again as sri yukteswar has already said it's it's very much your choice we can eat food because we'd like to be greedy i mean i myself am uh, <laughs> a culprit there many times you know food comes and the eyes open up and even just the very thought of the fact that i'm going to get to eat something that's you know really tasty and pleasurable you realize that you're not you're not looking at food anymore as some you know just this simple form of sustenance you're looking at food as some sort of fill a hole in me of fulfillment and then when you eat it from that perspective remember lack always begets lack never fulfillment <laughs> but if you already tune into the fact that ah this is me responsible for my body this is what i have to do this is very consciously i eat this and then i eat this this is how i use my senses this is when i have to use it for certain things this is when i can withdraw that's the kind of uh, power that we need to develop in ourselves in fact i remember reading from yogananda saying just for one day experiment with your own body and listen to it don't just have breakfast lunch and dinner because you do that every single day 365 days a year just once a week or you know once a, you know, just just listen to your body and you will be amazed to see how the body doesn't need so much food in fact you will feel that you don't need perhaps having three meals a day or even if snacks in between i mean perhaps one meal will be enough for some of you for some of us might be more but but the importance of not being guided by uh, mechanicals and automatons uh, schedules that we have created around us of i need these in order to be happy and especially meals try to see that perhaps sometimes the body doesn't need that specific food that you are craving for so experiment with that because the body can be used also as an experiment of keep detaching ourselves from the habits that we have developed you know for who knows not just only years but lifetimes so so use the the tool of your own physical body and 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 listen to it because it can give you many many clues and many directions of how to keep working with these daily things and overcoming desires and of course here he's also making the helping us see that of the sex desire it's in fact it's much stronger and so he's already giving us as narayani said okay why don't you start with food you know why don't you start with something simpler start with other things you know look at all forms of your senses and then see in which little ways can you kind of gain just a modicum of control over that because that's all there is as as you kind of you become a master of your senses then even those things that otherwise would easily pull you will little by little lose that power destroy wrong desires now otherwise they will follow you uh, follow you after the astral body is torn from the physical casing even when the flesh is weak the mind should be constantly resistant if temptation assails you with cruel force overcome it by impersonal analysis and indomitable will every natural natural passion can be mastered as also as we were saying if we don't work on any of these desires now if we allow them to drive our actions intentions then they just you know the prize that we get is that we get to carry them forward to the next life stronger than they were now and then we just keep allowing them to carry on lifetime after lifetime so the question isn't so much 
uh, you know, should I deal with it or not? The question is, when are you going to deal with it? Because if you don't do it now, you're going to have to do it next lifetime. If you don't do it then, and each time we postpone this process, it gets stronger. You know, and the fascinating thing is that not we always come back again and again every life, every each lifetime with those specific desire, desires. But even the people that we keep attracting in our lives have similar desires and tendencies of those that we are trying to overcome. So what we are looking here <laughs> is not just a pattern that needs to be overcome or worked out or worked out mm -hmm. yeah worked out or purified or to transmute as individuals but just let's all keep in mind that we are working also with our own potential environment that will be attracted in each lifetime so both aspects are playing a huge role in this transformation of the soul we not only start changing and working with our own desires but in the process we are already working at the level of how this transformation is also going to affect um, my environment in the years to come in the lifetimes to come to come and the people and family that is going to be part of that environment or that journey with ourselves. And so Sri Yukteswarji's advice here, especially for those of us who are yet not ready to overcome completely, is even as the desire is too strong than the will that we have right now, even if we do indulge, whatever it may be, he's not just referring to the uh, the sex desire it's in fact it's pretty much anything is while you are engaged in it even try to see if your mind can be disengaged from it and so little by little you start from you see everything has to start from the causal level to the astral level to the physical so when it gets to the physical level in fact it's too strong it's already there it's already gotten a lot of momentum behind it so when we're trying to change something if we're unable to kind of do it on the outward level, we should at least start from that causal level, from the thought level, by disengaging a little bit. Each time you give in to something, try to see, try to get the mind at least to, to inwardly resist. And that way you'll see you'll build up a greater potential to overcome. Conserve your powers. Be like the capacious ocean, absorbing within all the tributary rivers of the senses. Small yearnings are openings in the reservoir of your inner peace, permitting healing waters to be wasted in the desert soil of materialism. The forceful activating impulse of wrong desire is the greatest enemy of the, to the happiness of man. Roam in the world as a lion of self-control. See that the frogs of weakness don't kick you around. So, of course, you just come back to that original thought of yoga, which is all we have and all we are is our life force. That's the power we carry. And we have two choices. We can conserve it and grow it, or we can allow it to get dissipated. And everything we do uh, offers us that choice. And so, as long as we're aware of what we're doing, we will have a better chance to know what's the right path, what's the right decision, uh, moment by moment. I, I love the words that uh, Yogananda is using here to even <laughs> visually see that quality or those weaknesses as something really huge, majestic, powerful, like a lion of self-control. I mean, self-control is presented here as something as as, as the king of all virtues, you know, something that really will give you the power to, to win every battle, you know, the lion is the king of the jungle. And then he compares weakness with these little, you know, noisy frogs that just keep <laughs> jumping, you know, disturbing every single, you know, 
respond you know where <laughs> mine you know those thoughts those little weaknesses and anyway just so i love this particular one the the words he uses to compare you know self-control and weakness and gives emphasis like weakness sometimes we perceive them in ourselves or, or wrong tendencies or habits as something horrible you know like the worst thing we could have the greatest things that we have to overcome and he puts here the name of a frog like something that poof, we, we can destroy we can push away we can war with it in a very easy way because a weakness is just a tendency and and it's it's how we perceive that tendency or habit and and it's just yeah it's there but i don't need to give so much emphasis to overcome that weakness but rather to develop that self-control and weak power willpower that is needed so it's just a matter of redirect a little bit where do we want to put our energy and and work with a positive quality rather than emphasize a negative attitude that we need to constantly pay attention to the devotee is finally freed from all instinctive compulsions he transforms his need for human affection into aspiration for god alone a love solitary because omnipresent so as we start to build our love for God alone, somehow it feels like that means that we have to withdraw our loves from everything else and not just people, but things and possessions and desires and opportunities and ambitions. But then when you place your love in God alone and you realize that God is omnipresent, that very love expands and in fact becomes true love finally to the people around you, to the things around you, and to the world itself. And our world needs healing, our world needs love. But we're unable to give that love to it because, well, it's these little tributaries of desire and in uh, an attachment, and they have no power for any transformation. Moving on now to mm -hmm. a different subject. This is Sri Yukteswar ji uh, and his little interaction with his mother that uh, Yogananda is describing. And while they're interacting, Yogananda, who's sitting, you know, just watching the two of them, realizes that his mother is, you know, not Strong listening woman. to Sri Yukteswar ji's advice or whatever he's saying. And he overhears her say, Nay, nay, my son, go away now. Your wise words are not for me. I am not your disciple. <laughs> Sri Yukteswar backed away without further argument, like a scolded child. I was touched at his great respect for his mother, even in her unreasonable moods. She saw him only as her little boy, not as a sage. There was a charm about the trifling incident. It supplied a side light on my guru's unusual nature, inwardly humble and outwardly unbendable. So you're getting, we're just getting little glimpses also to the roundedness of, uh, of a saint, especially here Sri Yukteswar Ji. It's not just this one version that we know, okay, it was really hard. It was just in each moment, depending on who he was interacting with, depending on what was needed, what was appropriate, that's who he was and that's who we need to learn to be. Inwardly humble, outwardly unbendable in the sense of how we express ourselves, express our principles, but it has to come from a point of humility. The moment it comes, because Sri Yukteswar could e easily say, and it would be a completely right, Mother, I know everything. <laughs> I can see the past, I can see the future, I know every thought you're thinking right now. I think you should listen to me. And the Guru could say that to us, but they never do. Because everything that they do comes even still, even in omnipresence, it comes from humility. So we're going to have to really learn that quality very deeply until our actions are not inspired by humility. There is an always a chance that it will bind us even when we do right action. The monastic regulations do not allow a Swami to retain connection with worldly ties after their formal severance. He cannot perform the ceremonial family rites 
which are obligatory on the householder. Yet Shankara, the ancient founder of the Swami order, disregarded the injunctions. At the death of his beloved mother, he cremated her body with heavenly fire, which he caused to spurt from his upraised hand. Sri Yukteswar also ignored the restrictions in a fashion less spectacular. When his mother passed on, he arranged the crematory services by the holy Ganges in Benares and fed many Brahmins in conformance with age-old custom. The Shastric prohibitions were intended to help Swamis overcome narrow identifications. Shankara and Sri Yukteswar had wholly merged their beings in the impersonal spirit. They needed no rescue by rule. Sometimes, too, a master purposely ignores a canon in order to uphold its principle as superior and independent of form. Thus, Jesus plucked ears of corn on the day of rest. To the inevitable critics, he said, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And this is talking about the rules and guidelines that govern whether, in fact, any, any lifestyle, but here especially the spiritual life and to a certain degree in a more restrictive way, the religious life. But always we must remember, and especially now as we enter into um, a higher age of Dwapara where form has less power or needs to be given less power consciously than the spirit and the energy that enlivens it. And for all of us who have chosen to walk this path, there are certain principles that go beyond form that are far greater than anything, any, uh, you know, kind of restriction or rule that has been created, in fact, very consciously for our own benefit. And we must every now and then choose and see and feel and understand why we're doing what we're doing, be it the rituals of worship, of the pujas, of the mantras, the rituals even of self-control and brahmacharya, everything that we do, we must always remember and try in fact to express the principle behind it and not just the form. So if, the, if a form asks for us to be a little strict and a little, you know, particular, but the principle is not coming from a place of love and understanding, it's better to have love and understanding and let that form go temporarily for the benefit of somebody else, not for your own benefit, of course, but for somebody else, then it's more appropriate to be that way. Just as we just saw even Sri Yukteswarji with his mother, just more appropriate for him to be the child than to be the guru in that particular case. Similarly, for all of us, a time will come when it's more appropriate to be a friend than a teacher, more appropriate to be wrong than right. And this, of course, is just oh, from the Bible, it's just beautiful. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. You can place that for anything. This spiritual life was made for us. We're not made for the spiritual life. Every practice that we do is made for us. We're not made for that. However, we have to recognize that that practice serves a very, very conscious purpose. And so don't just kind of, ah, I don't need this because I'm beyond this until and unless, like Sri Yukteswar and Shankaracharya, you've merged and you've gone beyond it, then in fact, we can make those decisions more consciously. My Guru's ready wit and rollicking laugh enlivened every discussion. Often grave, Master was never gloomy. To seek the Lord, one need not disfigure his face, he would remark. Remember that finding God will mean the funeral of all sorrows. I love that line. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so good. And how they come up with just these just yeah, perfect, amazing, beautiful yeah. words. <laughs> but it's, here, of course, is this is just a very simple point that Yogananda Ji is making, and which is this perfect balance between being serious and, you know, very centered on the spiritual path, and at the same time, not getting too stern, too gloomy, too... Sometimes, I um, mean, even we've seen certain, I wouldn't call them saints, but spiritual aspirants, you know, who are living a very, a very austere life. And you just see their faces have hardened. 
you know, in that austerity. And I think we need to, again, just guard against it because the spiritual path is a path of joy. It's not a path of oh, hardships, even though sometimes it may feel that way. And as long as we can keep that consciousness of joy, even in those hardships, even in those austerities, that we should learn to laugh and have a sense of humor. But when needed, get immediately centered, immediately serious, immediately in the moment, uh, so that we don't also get too light. In fact, one of the main characteristics or hallmark, hallmarks, hallmarks mm -hmm. of any saint or any self-realized master, you can see in their eyes that spark, you know, that consciousness or that expression of underneath untouched joy. Mm. I mean, they can be expressed in terms of their temperament with according not different uh, personalities, but, but the consciousness of joy always remains there underneath. And that's, I think, the real state that every saint achieves and, and, and those who have really experienced, I mean, experienced God, that will be the main almost gift that can be given to, to that self-realized master where, where that joy is so strong within them that there is nothing really that affects uh, their consciousness anymore. There, there are no attachments, there are no possessions that they need to have. It's like that ever new joy always remains there. So I remember Swami Kriyananda towards the end of his life. I mean, someone would ask him, have you had any real experiences in meditation? Have you found God? I mean, can you see that? Can you see this other thing? Can you see my karma? What do I need? I mean, have you really had any experience of God in meditation, any, I don't know, whatever. Vision. Vision. And Swamiji would very humbly <laughs> will reply, no, I, I have not had any of that. Unfortunately, I have always wanted or I would love that, but I never had any of those things. But I'm feeling so much joy constantly in my heart that sometimes I have troubles and trouble not, not, not to have tears in my eyes. Not, just, it's very hard for me to contain that bliss. So to me, to some of us, to, to hear that answer, it's, it's enough. I, I don't need to know how much you know, uh, spiritual experiences you have as long as you are, you are becoming you are emanating, you are vibrating that ever new joy in every cell of your being. Now Yogananda Ji is talking about just visitors that would come to the ashram and how Sri Yukteswar Ji would kind of work with them or relate to them. And this particular one is where a very celebrated Pandit comes, you know, who has all this scriptural knowledge and he comes to kind of show his scriptural knowledge to Sri Yukteswarji, which doesn't go so well as he would have expected. A celebrated pundit received a similar jolt. This is to others who have received them. With ostentatious zeal, the scholar shook the ashram rafters with scriptural lore. Resounding passages poured from the Mahabharat, the Upanishads, and the bhasyas of Shankara. I am waiting to hear you, Sri Yukteswarji's tone was inquiring. As though utter silence had reigned, <laughs> the pandit was puzzled. Quotations there have been in super abundance. Master's words convulsed me with mirth. But what original commentary can you supply from the uniqueness of your particular life? What holy texts have you absorbed and made your own? 
In what ways have these timeless truths renovated your nature? Are you content to be a hollow Victrola, mechanically repeating the words of other men? Wow. <laughs> well, kind of makes us feel like we're reading these books and we're... <laughs> but... I'm talking about these books, it's like... Oh. Okay, we should close this session right now. <laughs> But isn't that just what we sometimes feel, you know, oh, I know this and I can read this and I have read that and, oh, have you read the, you know, whatever, the laws of the spirit world and have you somehow as if like, because I have read something, I am now fully in full possession of that realization and of that knowledge. And that's what, you know, most of us are, again, including ourselves, we're, we're in certain ways, we're parrots to the words of the saints. Um, but, you know, as long as we recognize we are parrots, <laughs> yeah. there's a huge potential for actual in- transformation, transformation and realization. Yeah. But when we start thinking that, uh, you know, I can say these words, so therefore somehow uh, they're mine or that I have attained enough uh, knowledge and awareness and wisdom to be able to parrot these words, that's when it gets a little tricky mm-hmm. for many of us. Again, we come back to that simple humility of understanding and recognizing where we are and as beautiful as these words are and uh, sometimes we do have deep understandings of them on a mental level but again that does not do much and these questions are important let's ask them again and take a moment each one of us to just feel what the true answer of these questions are and then we will know whether we're making true spiritual progress or not first What original commentary can you supply from the uniqueness of your particular life? Meaning, how has our life become an expression, an actual commentary on those specific passages, on those specific teachings? What holy text have you absorbed and made your own? Probably talking about the scriptures, not just any book. I guess definitely about the scriptures not which recent book have you read and made your own but which text written by a true master have you made your own in what ways have these timeless truths renovated your nature what changes do you see what transformations do you see can you see a clear pattern of an upward growth or are you only seeing more and more words being available to you to explain that process to others and are you content to be a hollow victrola are you content to be in in the example that narayana and i were using a parrot mechanically repeating the words of other men and perhaps many of us have to start there again it's not uh, we're not expected to already know or have some greater realization than is available to us right now in this particular case uh, Sri Yukteswarji was correcting something in that Pandit because the Pandit probably started off with this thirst for knowledge and probably with the hope and intention to experience the knowledge but as he realized his mind could grasp all these things and he could remember all these things uh, you can get confused and we do get confused very easily especially when so much information is available to us and today we've never had access to more information ever in the history or the known history of mankind so just be mindful of what you do with that information and don't just keep consuming and consuming for no particular purpose other than to be able then to share that I know this or I've read this or I heard this or look at me you know just say it exactly the way it's said in the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, Sri Yudeswar goes on <laughs> later on saying that don't confuse understanding with a larger vocabulary. I mean, that's like a boom. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Like that's the sentence, like boom, the mantra that we always need to keep reminding ourselves. I mean, Fortunately, one of the great advantages, (laughs) 
for some of us who don't know much the language, I will say this is, I feel like Marianne so Marianne is already good. ahead of us. <laughs> like, yeah, I have found my line here. This will save me. <laughs> and next time anybody says, you don't understand. I don't so, confuse Let me tell you what Sri Uteshwar says. <laughs> But anyway, very, very powerful statement, especially nowadays, where we are attracted above all of an image, a way to share a teaching or a lesson that sounds so like, wow, that person, <laughs> you know, speaks so well and knows so much and his intellect is so sharp. And we are being misguided even by Maya itself. It's, it's like... It's like Maya puts tricks in front of us and veils to see if we are able, re able really to, to, to recognize true wisdom versus just an appearance. If we really want the, the gift inside the package mm -hmm. or we just like the paper Wrapping. wrap, not paper wrap, mm -hmm. and the little boom, bow. bow. <laughs> He says of that Pandit, again, a very beautiful line that the discerning placement of the comma <laughs> does not atone for a spiritual coma. <laughs> so, you know, just because you know how certain things are written and expressed and the way you are able to deliver them does not necessarily mean that you're not in a spiritual coma, <laughs> just <laughs> spiritually dead, but somehow intellectually alive. He says over here, they prefer philosophy to be a gentle intellectual setting up exercise. That's what for most of us it is. Philosophy is just this intellectual exercise. Their elevated thoughts are carefully unrelated either, either to the crudity of outward action or to any scourging inner discipline. Now, if you haven't understood this, that makes perfect sense. So we are going to have to, these are the things you have to hear, read them again and again. It's so consciously that Yogananda Ji has written the autobiography of a yogi. He's, he's not put it in ways that you, we can just pass over it and say, yeah, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it. The words he uses force us to stop, read, reread, reread until we truly understand what he says. So again, they prefer philosophy to be a gentle intellectual setting up exercise. Their elevated thoughts are carefully unrelated either to the crudity of outward action or to any scourging inner discipline. So what this means is that as long as they think that they can hold these elevated thoughts, which are not even their own, that these are the thoughts of the scriptures and the words that they can hold on to that, somehow they feel that it does not have to relate to their outward actions. So how they live their life has no relationship to these wonderful sounding principles that they can, you know, at, at a given, at a moment's notice, just belt. Nor do they have any inner discipline. So they're not trying to really change themselves. They're not trying to take the scriptures and then see how they can express it in everything that they do. And the fact of the matter is that so are we the same way. We too believe the spirituality to be an intellectual exercise. I mean, unfortunately, you know, right here, this is a setting where Narayani and I on one level are propagating the very, this very reality. But at this stage, we have no other option. When we kept talking about and continue to talk about this ashram that we want to have, it's because we really want to go beyond this. We want to not be able to just kind of talk about these things, but have real ways, conscious ways available to everybody to put these teachings into practice. Earn and learn that humility through the simplicity of your seva. Find that true, you know, all these descriptions of the cosmic energy and consciousness that these saints have to find a space and a place where you can actually practice. experience and practice that through your own daily and deeper, longer meditations. Because, you know, face it, at home we don't get that opportunity. Ooh, you know, half an hour of meditation is not going to cut it. One hour of meditation is not going to cut it. And with people who are trying to do 
the same thing you are trying to do because sometimes even at home we want to practice these teachings and, and we really apply these experiments sometimes with our wife who is not interested at all you know or sometimes with our children who don't have yet the mental capacity even to understand what we are trying to teach them or you know with your neighbor with the shopkeeper and, and it's very difficult to apply these principles to to people who are completely closed even to what you have to offer even to that experiment or to that practice so so when we are in a place in an ashram like Sri Yuteshwar where all the disciples all those like-minded people are working towards the same goal it becomes uh, easier to keep constantly every minute applying and practicing the teachings so i think our next step i mean and i'm talking not just us as disciples of yogananda but for every truth seeking soul who really is ready for his next step should be place yourself in a constant environment with people who are working towards self-transformation otherwise it is very difficult so spiritual communities ashrams um, centers where there is not just you working on yourself but you are with people around you that also will accelerate that process i think is the need of the hour because we are seeing so much spirituality and so many people are joining the movement of spirituality and they are so sincere you can see some of them are way ahead of us and they are so ready for um, something else and i think experience and practical application of the teachings it's really going to be what can save the world because the world nowadays needs hands and feet who are really to get dirty, to do the job, to make a really a change. We come back to Narayani's favored oh, yeah. <laughs> line. My favorite one now. Do not confuse understanding with a larger vocabulary. Sacred writings are beneficial in stimulating desire for inward rela realization if one stanza at a time is slowly assimilated. Continual intellectual study results in vanity and the false satisfaction of an undigested knowledge. You know, <laughs> again, for those of us who enjoy reading and enjoy consuming the just the beautiful theories philosophies and the teachings of the great ones it's a good, it's important for us to recognize what is it that we're really wanting is it just that we're trying to fill ourselves with as much information as possible or that through them we're truly and uh, really trying to look for that same inner realization or and wanting to put all these things into practice that's why when narayani and i you know, first came online and started, we in fact were doing too much. We're doing t every day, okay, let's, uh, let's talk about this also, let's talk about this. And very soon we realized that, and in fact, we, all, we still feel we're doing more than ne that's needed, but, you know, this is where we are right now. At least let's keep people a little buoyed, a little more uplifted through something than through the lack of, or uh, through nothing. But if we just realize there's no way any of us are able to really digest this knowledge and this and assimilate this wisdom it's just hard and so we move from you know <laughs> class to class and chapter to chapter stanza to stanza both for the Gita and the autobiography of a yogi I mean we're consciously trying to keep them short enough so that you know and go deep into them and not just kind of say well this chapter was more or less about this you know, just trying, we're trying our best to go as slowly as possible for this very reason so that 
we don't think that oh what's next and let's you know quickly find or let's get to the good part let's get to when baba ji comes that we're really understanding that everything that we're reading is meant for us to be integrated to be practiced to be experienced and um, our next step as we keep saying is we want to provide a real place to do that we've had a center for 2 years which we've recently let go of and the center served a beautiful purpose but there too it was always a classroom setting it was all this always this understanding that you know the teaching comes in some sort of a teacher student reality but it doesn't come that way it comes vibrationally the teachings are assimilated far more through just being together individually just practicing them then talking about them or hearing about them or in a class setting and if there are classes there must they, their only purpose must be this just as sri yukteswar ji says sacred writings are beneficial in stimulating desire for inward realization and that's the only purpose a class should have mm. because the class cannot give you anything and uh, we're we're freely admitting this to you because it's of no use for anybody to think that by attending these classes somehow uh, your consciousness will change it won't by attending these classes the best that we can hope is that your okay. desire your inspiration the yearning grows <laughs> but that's all that's going to happen transformation of consciousness re- true realization that's a whole other way and that comes from the guru that comes from your guru bhais it comes from being together serving it comes so much from serving that you have no idea what you're missing out if you've not yet given yourself an opportunity to serve and for make you independent in the sense of you know the work that each one of us has to do constantly i mean we don't want to feed people with a Like with a spoon, spoon feeding, in, a spoon feeding <laughs> all the time because that also won't serve the purpose. I mean, even the guru himself doesn't do that with us. So we need to find a balance of how com- comfortable are we becoming, even in our way to receive spirituality. I, I think eventually this also will need to be balanced in the same way that the world you know put its foot down in march and say you guys are going too far in one direction now let me just lock you down <laughs> in a room in a house so you can you know recenter yourself but now it feels that we are you know becoming so comfortable in this way that eventually we will need to balance this aspect too